old school. I, um, it is my honor and pleasure to, okay, does everybody hear that weirdness? Oh. I think, I think everyone probably needs to mute there. Someone has some back um, channel going on. Okay. And I think it's you, my girl, Ashley Ann. You can probably mute her too. Um, well, she just, yeah, <laughs> she just fell off. So we are going to start and Ashley Ann is going to join us here in just a second. Um, I am thrilled uh to welcome maggie kane and ashley ann masters um maggie i don't know if you know this but your um your presence is known near and far and um we were talking about who would be best that we would want to hear from um who was connected to you kirk who kind of understood what the network was and Neil Meyer, who's in Michigan, is the one that gave me your name. And I didn't even realize until sort of uh, into into the email conversation um, that I mean, I did realize once I realized both of you were uh, at NC State, the connection with Ashley Ann. Um, and so Maggie is a graduate and was a participant in campus ministry when she yeah. was in college and a, a place at the table is um, a, a nonprofit ministry that is a pay as you can um, cafe. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad to, I'm, I'm happy to explain that further too. the the funny thing is, is I had no idea who Neil was until about two hours ago when he came to eat lunch at a place at the table. Um, and we realized we have many common people. So Neil, you did not just say that you're the one that invited me to be a part of this panel, but thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here with y'all. I grew up Presbyterian and I was in campus ministry at NC State. Um, and my aunt's a Presbyterian pastor, you know, I got, I got all the connections. <laughs> and I'm good friends with Ashley Ann, if she's joined yeah. yet. I'm that I'm a proud friend of Ashley Ann. Yeah. And Ashley Ann is connecting. Um, uh, there are storms where she is. So, so we are, we are, we are grateful when she will be able to get on. But the reason um, that we thought of you, Maggie and, um, and Ashley Ann, for this conversation, uh, the um, sort of official unofficial title is Herding Cats, uh, but it's on team building and how do you create a team, um, particularly when it's a volunteers. Um, there's difference when you can say, I'm not gonna pay you if you don't come, um, yeah. but you began a place at the table out of an idea and a dream and, and discernment. And then Ashley Ann, when she arrived at PCM, um, had to do quite a bit of rebuilding and re-engaging um, when she got there. And so I know that our network, is, we are always, it seems, in the process of beginning something new or rebuilding um, something that we've done. And so we are grateful to have you here. So I'm gonna kick it off to, to both of you. Well, I'll also say, um, I don't see it. Is Ashley Ann on here now? Um, I, I'll also say we actually were birthed, so a place at the table, a little back history. We were birthed out of volunteers in a Presbyterian church. So in the church that Ashley Ann is in every single day, that is how a place at the table started with a lot of incredible folks um, from the church and from other places. Um, but we, uh, yeah, again, birthed out of, out of and from volunteers out of that church. Um, so for all who do not know, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about Place the Table. We are a pay what you can cafe. What that means is we look and feel like a regular restaurant, but when you, um, yeah, again, you walk in, you see a regular restaurant, but all of our prices are suggested. So some people pay the suggested price. Some people pay more and pay it forward. Some people pay less, and then some people volunteer for their meal. And so, um, we have a lot of volunteers in and out of this place. We've had a lot of volunteers over the years. We were founded in 2014. We did not open until January of 2018. So it took about four years to get off the ground. Um, no one was hired on staff. 
um, until end of 2017. So we are, we were and still are mostly volunteer run, um, whether that be um, volunteers that are in the cafe, and I can go into that um, as well, whether that be board members or whether that be committee members. So I'm excited to be here and excited to, to chat about some of these different ways to really engage volunteers, but I'll let Ashley in, introduce herself first. Sure, thank you. Can you all hear me, see me? Am I real now? You're real, okay. we can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, um, well, there's there's a lovely storm behind me that you'll see maybe. Um, looks like a weather report. We're just gonna do that today. Um, so um, I heard a bit of that. And yeah, so it started out in West Raleigh Press, which is where I am. And what makes our campus ministry unique um, is the relationship with West Raleigh. I am, the director of a 501c3 that is housed in a church and was birthed in the church, um, which is really unique. So um, it goes back to, I mean, the 60s and 70s, but essentially the Synod decided and declared that forever the downstairs room of um, West Raleigh Presbyterian would be campus ministry space. So that was set in stone forever ago. And um, so then they've had various campus ministers throughout. Some were on staff at the church as like an associate role. And then in the 90s, they split to be their own entity. So since 1993, PCM Raleigh has been separate budget, separate. That's when the board was created. It wasn't just session members and volunteers. It started its own thing. Um, and so that's been since 1993. Um, and they have had the campus ministers have always been clergy, but not installed at the church necessarily at that point. So I'm the first installed female campus minister they've had, um, even though it's long history of being very um, at the forefront of, you know, women's issues, social justice, all of that. Um, and so we have, we had to create a board. And when, when I started, we basically were still building the board. Um, and so now, now it's in a very different place. But um, yeah, so that's what makes ours unique in terms of I'm not on staff at the church. I have office space at the church. The student center is the church building. Um, and obviously, you know, the head of staff is right across the hall from me. So we work very closely together, but have a board and a session and two different budgets. Yet every decision kind of has to be in line with each other, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's one of those things. So um, we do not rent the space. It is always, it's their commitment is that it's always free. In addition to a much like a place at the table, we are a key mission of the congregation. So in terms of their mission budget, the two biggest line items are PCM and a place at the table. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, I just learned a lot too. So I, I love that Ashley Ann and I'll, I'll note on top of that, um, just because you kind of did that breakdown that we have a staff so we have a, 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 a top we have a board of directors we have 15 board members um four people have a role so we have a board chair vice chair secretary and treasurer um then we have um a staff so we have a staff of 15 um, and then we have a lot of volunteers that make this happen every single day. We have committees that volunteers sit on. So we have five committees um, and different volunteers, whether that be board members or just outside folks in the community that want to help serve in a different capacity, whether that be help with marketing, uh, help with our fundraising team, help with our, um, you know, fi financials, right? So back in financials. Um, we have different people that sit on these committees, um, but then we have about, I'd say, 200 people that volunteer regularly in the cafe. So that is a whole separate group of volunteers. Um, there's some crossover, but it's, it's all separated. Um, and we have a volunteer coordinator. Luckily, we hired one end of 2019, and she helps coordinate those volunteers. I help coordinate the committees. She helps coordinate the volunteers in the cafe. That was just a brief rundown summary. <laughs> That's a lot of volunteers. <laughs> and then we even, have even just the board and the committees. That's a lot of volunteers. It's yeah. a lot. It's yeah. a lot. 
And so uh, either one of you, how did you all begin when you when you thought, okay, we've got to get people who um, not just are warm bodies, uh, but that are invested. Um, at the beginning, what did you all find out? Was it easy, difficult? Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah. Um, well, I think both, yeah, I will say, I, I mean, I, so I've been in this role for four years. I inherited a legacy that sells itself. That's a huge gift. Um, campus ministry historically is well respected and well resourced and well supported in no in the triangle. I mean, it's an embarrassment of riches in North Carolina how many campus ministries we have. I think our presbytery has the most currently active ones of any in the nation. Um, so it's embarrassingly delightful to inherit that. That said, um, you know, it is all everything is fundraising because it's every everything is donations. We are all donation driven, and a lot of our people have all the same passions and give to all the same things, like a place at the table, like campus ministry. And so, I mean, and the Raleigh nonprofit network is so well resourced and such a good, everybody's got such good relationships that all of us, I mean, I think what's what's unique about that, you know, coming from Chicago to a smaller city, but it's, it's so, the network is so good because all of us are like, okay, we wanna get everybody's buy-in and we wanna have everybody's support and everybody support the thing they're passionate about and in the best way, it's sort of everybody stays in their own lane, but then resources each other. So it's not competition. Um, and so, you know, like I tell folks all the time, we're recruiting board members or just, so you know, financial supporters, whatever, like money is fabulous, obviously. It's dirty green paper, though, at the end of the day, if you're not passionate about the mission of whatever you're giving to. And while I can always use your money, I would rather have a board full of people who give $2 a month but they are all in like mind, body, spirit. They will, you know, and it's, I can call them at midnight if I have a student in the ER and I'm not sure exactly what to do with that. Or I can call them and say, you know, like with COVID for instance, I mean, there was this whole thing before we got the grant that we did to give groceries to students during that. Um, you know, there was this whole thing of what do you, like, I guess I'm now dropping food off at students' doorsteps. Is that what we're doing now? Does anybody have a better idea? You know, that kind of thing. And I got often I would get food from a place at the table and take it to students um, or it would be groceries or Advil or cough syrup, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I would I would much rather in the day have people that I can talk that through with because I'm the only full time paid staff member that we have. And so I don't I don't trust my pandemic brain, but I always want, you know, two heads, three heads, four heads are all always better. And so to have people to bounce those things off of. And when I made like COVID safety policies and now the vaccine trip policy, I want somebody to run that by who I know has the best interest of young people and the program and me at heart. I don't really care how much money they give. And that's not what I'm thinking. Like when I look down the list of who can I call to help with this? What's their dollar amount that they get? I'm thinking, what is their, that is what everybody needs. Uh, and it's, it's fabulous to have somebody like, this is how she chooses to donate her time and how great. And it's, you know, it's just, it's super helpful to have people that have different skills and talents. And to me, that's more important than the money. You can always find the money. And that's, I mean, I'm a preacher's kid of a solo pastor. You can always find the money. Um, my mom did international development too. So, that's, you know, I learned a lot about that. That was, you know, mom's whole thing was always say, thank you, don't ask for money. Um, and there's an element of truth to that too in narratives. I mean, this is, we tell the story and certainly we have, you know, from our program, there's tons of every single graduate is doing something that God created them to do. And we're telling those stories. Um, we have some that just happen to be in Raleigh, like a place at the table. Everybody that's been to the program is doing something amazing, though. And so it's how do we tell the story of why this was meaningful and why we wanted to be meaningful for other people? And from the faith side, that answer is baptism. We promise to fulfill baptismal vows um, from birth to death, right? And so it's not just, you know, I think often in church land, we think baptismal vows are making sure there's really good CE programs and good VBS and good confirmation and a youth group. And that is fabulous. 
Um, but it also extends like this, everything I do is fulfilling baptismal promises that other people made. Um, and there's no such thing as other people's children. So how do we do that? And again, that's where I would rather have board members who say, I want to come every Wednesday night and have dinner with young people and get to know them. Great. If you never give me a dollar, but you do that, that's fine. Um, and, you know, from the other side, I do want to say I have a board that everybody gives money. And so that's my policy is everybody gives something to be on the board, because that's often what people ask. How much do I have to give? You know, and I'll say it doesn't matter. Like, I, I want your passion and your time. I would love to be able to say we have 100% giving of our board, and we do. And um, and I intentionally don't look at those numbers. We have a part-time paid office manager. She knows what board members give. I will never look because I truly don't want to know. Um, obviously, I know our budget, and I know there's just one gift line item. That's all that I intentionally look at because it's just I don't I don't want to know because I, it truly doesn't matter to me. Their buy-in is more important, but it does matter that we have 100%. So that they can also say to other people, I serve on a board. And everybody is so invested that we all not only give financially, but we all give of our time and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's where, but again, it's when you inherit a program that sells itself, then you can just be creative with then what's, what's my stamp on the legacy going to be from this season, which of course, you know, with COVID has taken a different turn, but at the end of the day, it's baptism. And that's what I say in minute for mission. So if I'm in a pulpit saying this, it's, if you made baptismal promises, then we are only as good as your confirmation in youth programs, right? If every youth leader in the denomination quits being creative, we don't have campus ministry anymore. And the next, you know, when it comes to whatever 25 to 45 year olds are doing, that's also that it all goes back to baptism because each single stage is where we can really nourish people and help discern their call. Um, and again, that's, that is something that sells itself because it's a really cool season of life to get to journey with each other. Yeah, that's so awesome. Um, our, I'll, I'll follow up a little bit. I am I am just such a believer in everything Ashley and just said. It's huge. <laughs> it's, it's just huge to what you do to find those ambassadors, the folks that, that will, who are your, I learned long ago, find your eagles. And I, that's just another coin for, um, find your people, find your ambassadors who, um, those people who will, always be out in the community telling your mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. um, so our story is a little different. We di uh, did not inherit a program that program that had been around for years and years. Um, it, but what I always say is we, if we were to open overnight, right? If I had said this back in 2014, I wanna open a restaurant and open a, in a year's time, we would not be here today. There's a big myth and rumor in Raleigh that um, in Raleigh, there's this big developer named John Kane, same last name spelling, he owns every building in Raleigh practically. And so people always think that I'm his daughter. And I would say, yeah, that would have been great to be able to have money overnight, to have a space that we could call home for a place at the table. But we, again, would not be here today. And we would not have the people that we have. Um, so I, you know, when people ask, how did you fundraise the money? How did you open this cafe that cost half a million dollars. And I and, and what did you do over the years? And I said, we didn't fundraise over the years that it took. So it took four years to get off the ground. We friend raised. So we built the friends that now make a place at the table happen every single day. We spent four years making friends, building friends that make it possible from people who dine with us, donate, volunteer. Um, but specifically highlighting volunteers um, when we first got off the ground, again, we were all volunteer run. We had no paid staff. And still to this day, we are mostly volunteer run. We are finally hiring folks to do bookkeeping. We're finally hiring folks to help with some back end stuff. Um, before it was all volunteer based. So I had volunteers doing our payroll for us. I had volunteers doing um, volunteer coordinating with me. And so you know, and that's because that those four years that we spent getting to know people. Um, day one, we again just started making friends. We held events, information sessions. We intentionally asked people that you know that those small um, champions as ambassadors that we had. We said, "Hey, to the next event, can you invite two more friends that you think would love what we're doing?" And then the next event, we said, "Okay, 
can those two friends invite two more friends? And so we started having these events with with lots and lots of more people who wanted to get involved and then those people became in our ambassadors we would then we would then ask those ambassadors hey can you post on your social media and invite more people and so what we found is that each event that we had we would have another 50 people that would show up wanting to get involved in some sort of way um we would have um long clipboards of paper full of emails keep them on an email newsletter with that we sent out weekly at the time. God, I can't imagine doing a, a weekly newsletter right now, um, <laughs> we out, right? We sent out weekly and in that we put a couple of different ways for people to get involved. Um, I spent, I was very fortunate to work, to work at a bar at night. So I could in the day, I could go meet with all these folks wanting to volunteer. And I just got to know them. They became my friends. I kept them on a list. I sent them thank you notes. I sent them letters in the mail, um, just keeping them in the loop on anything and everything that they could get involved with and really making them feel like they were a part of a community. And they were, they were my community. Um, they were they were building this mission with us. Um, and, and in the beginning, we had so many hands-on committees that I needed all the help I could get from a committee that was, a, it was called cafe co committee. We had an outreach committee. We had a marketing committee. And so I just kept, hey, okay, so you're good at marketing. All right, I'd love for you to sit on that committee that met, that met once a month. Oh, you love planning events? Great, you're gonna sit on the event committee. Um, and so all these different people sat on all these committees. Some are now not a committee anymore, but as soon as we opened up a place at the table, they, they organically kind of filled in in some roles internally inside the cafe, uh, inside the cafe. Um, when I started, and this is um, touching on what Ashley Ann mentioned, um, when, when I started really needing roles, like that accounting, that bookkeeping, that payroll role, um, I just found myself sitting down with lots of different people and asking what their skill set was and what they would be interested in doing. So there's a CPA in front of me saying, I would really love to help on the back end. Okay, great. We need help doing payroll. Would that be something you're interested in? And sure, it wasn't It wasn't just someone random, right? Uh, it was someone that I knew connected via friends, via whoever, um, but found people that had different skills than I had. I went to, I'm so fortunate to graduate from NC State. But I, I will honestly say I'm not good at a lot. I am good at talking to people. I'm not good at accounting. I got a C in accounting in college. I'm not good at, at um, like event planning or anything like that. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Um, but uh, I, um, sorry, my staff's leaving for the day. But I'm not good at a lot of those things, but I found people that were really good at it and asked them to get involved. What I found is that people really want to help you just have to ask them and you have to give them a purpose. So that mission part, but then something to actually physically do. Um, and so I found that I found these accounting people, these restaurant people, these um, fundraising people gave them something to do. And then they were hooked and then they were a part of the team. Then they were our ambassadors and the list goes on. Ashley Ann, any follow up on that? No, I think um, I just saw a message about inact like board members who are not super active. And I think that's, um, yeah, we had some of that um, when I when I started. And uh, I actually, I had board members when I started that said, I joined this board because I was told I'd never had to do anything. And I said, well, that, that, that changes now. Like, we're not doing that anymore. Um, that is appalling. And other things I won't say because this is recorded, but that's not how we do things now. Um, and so I, yeah, our world, that was true before because they thought they didn't have to, and that it would just be a good volunteer thing to sit on the board because they cared about it, but they didn't have to do anything. That's not how it is now. We um, did that. And I think for ours, you know, when we vet board members, the way we do it now is um, one of our current, we have a committee of people who, you know, nominating committee equivalent I don't remember what we call it um but it's it's two board members who then recruit other people um because for ours 
to have a seat on our board, your congregation has to give at least $500. Um, and that's really the only stipulation. So they meet with people and I say, you know, take them the coffee, ask why I can't this ministry matters to them, ask what they know about campus ministry, ask what they know about Raleigh, ask what they care about in Raleigh, ask what they do in Raleigh, that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's that's sort of how we do it. I intentionally don't go to those things because I think it needs to be, I'm big on like priesthood of all believers style. Um, I don't want to handpick board members. I don't want a board of all my friends. I don't want any of that. I want truly the work of the people. You know, they don't know anything about campus ministry and they're, you know, like a retired pediatrician. How we now do it in our recruiting, which again, that's new in, in my tenure here. So this, what do you know about us? You know, because it's also helpful to learn what your reputation is in your community. What do people already know? What do you not know? What do we need to do better? Um, that kind of stuff. And for us, you know, one of the first things we did, or I did when I first got here, 18, and that was because they had, and so we're the first more like campus, you know, vetting people for lack of a better term, as they become board members of, you know, what do you know about more like, why does this matter to you? Um, and we now have people, some people who want to be on our board because we're more like, because that's a, a really important to their family narrative or for whatever reason, or, you know, there's a million things like that. So that's where, um, I think for us, yeah, it's all in how we get people now. That's sort of how we hit that off in the past. So I don't, um, yeah, I don't have anybody currently who fits that, but I did when I started because of, you know, old systems and that kind of thing. And I think it is not uncommon, but I think it is easy for those um, who had that question looking to change course. It can be done quickly. And I will say in terms of church plan, I mean, in my first year, we had new plans of how to vet people. We were getting new board members and we were more like campus ministry all within year one. And in church plan, that is extremely quick change. Um, but the beauty of campus ministry is, you know, you can, and again, I, I realize the unique piece of it is I am a 501c3, so I can sort of operate quick, sometimes quicker than church style. But I think um there are ways to do that the same way of let's just change how we bring people in and what is the relationship you already have and that kind of stuff and i think um and you know it's i also told the board i said you know here's here's some ideas of how to do that right i said you know i think like when i started we didn't we had three attorneys on the board no physician no educators like why are we a campus ministry board that doesn't have an educator? That makes no sense. Everything we do is rooted in academia. And yet, like, what? why? And it's just like that. Of, they weren't thinking of it that way. They were thinking of, well, this person's already an elder or a deacon. And I'm like, yeah, that's great for elders or deacons at your church. That's not we are. We're not a prophet. So, I mean, I love a deacon. I love an elder. I don't really care if you are that, if you care about campus ministry, come do something new or alongside, right? So uh, mentality of, you know, I said, that's how in my, you know, my dream world, we would have an educator and a physician and an attorney at all times, no questions asked and clergy, because there was no clergy on my board. And that's where, you know, you need somebody to say stuff like, it's not vacation if you're doing a webinar from a beach house, you know, like those kind of things of you ever, every, local group needs a pastor on their board for me. Okay, Ashley Ann, you've you've kind of gone out of range. <laughs> Especially in campus ministry, you need that colleague to see yourself, especially in a director role for a lot of stuff. Okay, so that that last part was garbled, and so maybe you can put that in the chat. Um, and and so Maggie, you know, uh, kind of the question for you. It sounds can you like, um, barely. You keep going okay. in and out, Ashley. Ann. Yeah, the, the go ahead. 
it, it sounds like it from the very beginning, Can you hear people who no? opted in to a place at the table, the idea yeah. they knew what phase you were in. Yeah. Um, how did you create a team though? It, yeah. Ashley and was sort of talking about, you know, these are people who are invested in campus ministry. Um, a lot of campus ministers, they have boards that work, but they're not, it's not really a team. They just, they're all like spokes on the wheel. Sure. You know. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, this, I don't think this is an easy answer other than you make them feel a part of the team. You include them in all the conversations. You, you give them literally a, a place at the table to have that voice. Um, you, I mean, I truly, I, I made them feel a part of it and I'm not, I'm not like, you know, giving myself a pat on the back. I just, I made everyone feel like they had a voice. I included them in the conversations. I, I wrote thank you notes. Like it was my job. I still do. Um, anytime I meet with someone for the first time, anytime I, um, someone did something small, I sent a thank you note. It, gratitude goes a long way. And, and it sounds like it was fake. It wasn't. I really was so grateful. They wanted to be a small part of the team. Um, I highlighted them. I, right, I did volunteer shout out to them. Um, I connected them to other people. So, right, we pull people in to have a meeting and I instantly make a connection between the two people. And then they become friends. And then they're on the team together. And so it's this, it's, I always say table is this, a place at the table is this community movement where everyone feels a part of the team because they've really had a, a part to play in it. Um, and so, so I, I was very, in, I'm sorry, I was very intentional about those connections and where, where, you know, you picture a tree, where those branches connect um, to each other and and then making them feel like they were a part of the team by sending multiple gratitude emails letters in the mail um hosting volunteer events so like volunt every year a volunteer appreciation party just for volunteers you are invited we appreciate you we are thankful for you um giving volunteer gifts a couple times a year so a sticker can go a long way a sticker and a thank you note um mm -hmm. So just being very intentional about um, making that volunteer feel loved, connected, and a part of a bigger team. Did that answer your question? I mean, a little bit. I think, you know, what are you all seeing in the field about, um, you know, I think you have people who really want to do things, but you know, they're not really, they in, in they connect with you, but they don't necessarily connect with other people or or sure. what are some of the questions um, from everyone else? I, I'll also note while you're typing in questions that I, um, similar to Ashley Ann, I, I was pretty intentional too about it not just being me. So if someone wanted to get involved, okay, um, I'd, I'd love for you to set up a meeting with um, one of our board members as well. I'd love for you to set up a meeting with this person and then I'll make that email introduction. So getting them to play a part in someone else's work too, getting them to feel connected to another human um, so it wasn't just me. I, I mean, I think that is something we fight every day. So I'm not going to say it, it works every time, but um, also someone asked you, and we have a governance a, a board governance and nominating the committee a, a team that does meet individually with people wanting to join committees people wanting to join the board and so they will meet offline with different people who are interested in getting involved and and then they'll also help find them a place so i try to pull other people into those conversations whether it's sitting down with the two of us or whether it's an offline conversation <laughs> So yeah, I see. How do you approach conversations with your board asking them to be sustaining donors? I don't know, Ashley, if you want to go first, I've been talking or I can jump in. Sure. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say for ours, again, like I, I intentionally, I don't want to know what each of my board members gives um, financially. I, I choose not to know that, but our, um, our part-time 
office manager does know that. And again, with sustainability, for me, that question, I mean, this is this is why I'm not a head of staff or in charge of stewardship committee, right? Because my my answer to sustainability is not I don't I don't only go to money on that. I think if I've got your buy in forever, um, that that's that's what I want, because then it is word of mouth that when your tenure is out on the board of your, your term is up, then you can tell someone else at your church why this is so meaningful to you and how it impacted you or your children or whatever. You know, I think honestly, when it comes to sustainability, um, it's people who have ties in the community and people whose children benefited from this program. I mean, that's and that's true in church anywhere, right? Um, but I think especially with this, I have um, right now, I have four, maybe five, five um, folks who have kids aged 18 to 28. And they not necessarily, I mean, none of them are um, were in our program currently. And that's, I do have that caveat. I also added that of, I would, I really want parents because I want to know how things sound to parents when I pitch things, but I don't want a parent of a current student ever for confidentiality of pastoral care when I share that kind of stuff with the board. So I do have that caveat for board members that I would love for you to be a parent of, you know, a future or former student, but not current for confidentiality. But um, I, I think that was sustainability. The parents, um, everybody appreciates every single adult in their child's life who loved their kid and that's where i think if that's um that's a huge part of sustainability for campus ministry in general is to get parents on board because it's such a unique relationship like you with youth group you're signing forms and permission slips campus ministry they're just entrusting their kid to you and you hold this beautiful season of their life that they may not always be privy to but later they'll look back and hear about the breakup and hear well who did you call to talk through that because you didn't even tell me it was the campus minister, it was the counselor, it was, you know, the RA, that kind of thing. And so that's a huge piece of that. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, financially, again, ours is mostly church, not individual donors. So ours, um, we just go around to churches and continue to ask for support. Our Presbytery is also incredibly supportive. So I think we're unique in that. I know we're unique in that. Our Presbytery is ridiculously generous. Um, and so, again, I'm, I'm kind of skewed on that because I don't, that, that piece is not the trouble piece. It was the like, get people's emotional and faithful buy-in. That, that, was, that was more of the challenge when I got here. I don't yeah. know if that's a helpful answer at all. Yeah, no, it is helpful. Um, I, we are a little different. We want every board member to be a sustainer, a sustaining donor. Um, we think it's really valuable, really important to be able to say, like Ashley Ann said earlier, all board members give. We also don't ask a certain amount. It's just pay what you can but we ask them to be sustaining donors because um, we then can go tell people, this is how we sustain month to month. Um, and you, we, you, we really, ha you have bought in when you're giving month to month, if, even if it's $2 a month. Um, and so I, how do I do that? I sit down with each board member once a year and, and make that ask, um, whether it's to be a sustainer, whether it's just to catch up with them and, get, and, and see how they're feeling. But I do ask each board member, um, myself or the board chair, I've seen it both. So the board chair can also make those asks as well. Um, so that's that. Um, what I like this question, what board size have you found to be effective and ineffective? So last year we had 20 board members, a global pandemic hit and we have to go all online. It was actually easier on Zoom with 20 board members than it was in person yep. with three board members. So I think 20 is way too many. Um, our bylaws say minimum five, maximum 20. We will never do 20 again. So right now we have 15. Um, so I think anywhere from 10 to 15 is, is kind of the sweet spot for a place at the table for sure. Um, with having boarded yep. committees, how many people on each? We have um, about anywhere from five to 12 people on committees. And that is, each board member has to serve on a committee. So they serve on one committee. Um, our board meets every other month and that's been huge for us. Um, if you ever want any um, sort of consent agenda or you know board agendas, how we do things, let me know. Um, we send out, we every committee sends, they, so board meeting meet, board meeting, the next month's committee, the next month's board, the next month's committee. Um, and so each board member 
um, is asked to serve once a month, basically, in some sort of capacity, um, as well as come to the cafe and things like that. Um, but one meeting, one, one long meeting. And so um, we, each board member sits on a committee, and then we have some outside folks making up that five to 12 people on each committee. And ours, we've got, um, we typically have 10 to 15, which for all the same reasons of this sort of a sweet spot. Um, and so we have two to three on each committee based on those current numbers. And yeah, same Zoom. I mean, I, I really miss seeing them in person, obviously, but for efficiency sake, for Zoom, it was really, really helpful. Um, and we, we meet monthly and committees give reports monthly. Ours, I would say probably mimics more of like a session type style of that um, in terms of motions and all of that thing. Um, and so, yeah, any, any of the motions come from committees, everybody, we have an agenda every month that gets emailed out. So you add to it ahead of time, which does help with efficiency too, of, you know, nobody's showing up with like, oh, let's talk about why we should have pizza every Tuesday now, right? Like that's, you know, if, if you want to do that, you have to put it in writing ahead of time. So that also helps with efficiency. Um, but yeah, we have two to three people on each committee and they get to choose that because again, I want, I want their buy-in. I want to put people where they're going to shine, right? Like you don't, you know, if you're trying to teach a fish to color, it's not going to work. Um, and so that's where we've got folks, the folks who are the extroverts are on the like recruit and nominate committee. The folks who are introverts who love numbers are on like treasury, right? I have two that are on my HR committee because that didn't exist. And I'm like, I feel like we should have that. I want people I can go to in confidence to ask questions and do my terms of call and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's how we do ours. They get to choose which committees they're on based on vacancies and passions and gifts and that kind of thing. And we're always open to new things. So as new people come, there's, I mean, we all have blind spots. So there's probably some super brilliant idea for a committee that we're not doing right now that some new person will bring, which is why I'm big on, you know, the terms, you can stay two terms, um, but not anymore. And that's, and that's because we have somebody who is a fabulous, lovely human who's super dedicated and has been on the board literally 40, over 40 years. That's not, I mean, wh how beautiful and what dedication, but that's not efficient when it comes to board turnover and that kind of thing. But he is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And will always be a supporter of PCM. Um, but in terms of you know, bylaws, you know, that, that kind of stuff, that's where you get, you know, it gets kind of muddy um, because nobody wants to offend anybody and people can still use their gifts and we want them to still use their gifts. We also want more people at the table making decisions about that while all the former members are still recruiting in the community and talking us up and all of that. So um, yeah, I think that's where terms are really helpful because you get new ideas, not because you don't want these fabulous people to stay on. And so the second part of Neil's question is what was something you tried that didn't work? Oh, a lot. Um, today, internet, um, let's see. Uh, Oh, well, so one thing we tried was our weekly, you know, we meet every Wednesday night and I thought it would be great to have at least one board member come every Wednesday night to have dinner with the students. Our, our um, sort of what we do is from six to seven, it's a meal. And then from seven to eight, it's a program. And, you know, I can understand not wanting to stay the whole time. And depending on the program, students may not want the board member there for like, you know, dating or, or alcohol night, right? I mean, fair enough. Um, but my in my head, we could have a board member every Wednesday night and that would be so fabulous. And then they would know each other because the board didn't know the students and vice versa. And that was just, I really, it was too much. It was too much to ask of people. Um, and this is where, you know, one of my blind spots is I am not a parent and I'm single. And so I see that as like, oh, I can totally give, you know, one Wednesday night every six weeks, but I, I don't have anybody who's relying on me at home at night, which is very different. And so that's, um, a huge blind spot for me. And so, yeah, it, it didn't work because my idea was rooted in what's normal to me, which is not normal to other people necessarily. So we realized that that was too much to ask and the board members felt it was too much to ask, not because they don't want to be there, but because again, these are people that are super active in the community, which is fabulous. And they have kids or spouses or parents to take care of or whatever. Um, and so we, the compromise was that once a month, two board members would come to a dinner. 
and that's so that that's what we're doing instead. And I think that's that's the beauty of monthly meetings is you can you know that was a, it was a quick change. It's one of those you know, it's I'm a big fan of you you just keep going and you learn from it. It's not so much failure as like that didn't work, so let's try something else. Um, and that's I'm never afraid to try something and it not work. I don't. To me, you learn more from when it doesn't work, and that's. Um, so that yeah, that's that's one of our big things. That was my dream. That was you know expecting too much as you know I don't know how else to say it um, of them based on their season of life. Um, yeah, I had that dream based on my season of life, not theirs. Um, but the compromise is good because now students recognize board members in the grocery store and that kind of thing because they did see them at dinners and that kind of stuff. And so it's yeah, I mean I think that's there's going to be tons of those kind of things. That again, if you're meeting monthly and there's ongoing communication, then it's not a whole big thing. You just change it as you're going, as opposed to like nine votes on it three months later, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, that's such a great question. I There are so many things that we tried that didn't work, um, but I will say we learned a lot. We really did um, in every every little thing that we tried over the four years to build and still to this day. Um, Oof, I could the list goes on, but I'll say board specific as well. Um, we try to do fellowship events and uh, full transparency. It didn't work. People did not want another thing to do. And so yep. we we tried really hard to, oh, you joined this board. You really want to gather with other board members and fellowship and um, and and do those things. And it didn't work. People just a couple people showed every time. And so um, that was unfortunate, but they see each other in the cafe, you know, we see each other at meetings, things like that. The other thing that didn't work um, that I highly, I'm sure y'all would not do this, um, maybe you would, but we used to have our, our board meetings at a uh, restaurant. So one of our board members owned a restaurant in town and we used to have it at a restaurant. And so servers would come around, we were in a private dining space and there were snacks um and they are and people order drinks and that was um it, it happened for about two years and um at you know the, the end of that second year uh we realized that um some fights were breaking out and people were getting upset and the alcohol was not helping um and so we immediately changed that and we'll never have alcohol for another meeting again and so yep. we, we definitely yep. realized that didn't work while it was fun and it was social and we had good food and good wine. Um, it, it, uh, it didn't work. So now when we go back to having it at a restaurant, which we might do um, post the Zoom, Zoom time, um, we'll probably have it a place at the table. But if we do go to another restaurant, we'll have the meeting and then we'll have a happy hour after where yep. if people want to stay, they can to, to gather and hang with each other. Uh, the part of that that we found people loved is they did like to hang out together. So that's why we tried to add the fellowship events because they did want to hang out with each other, but in one night, like to Ashley Ann's point of adding too many things on people's calendars. Yep. Um, let's see, British, I think I just saw your question about board. Uh, yes, so students, um, our, so we have a student leadership team, which is a whole other team of volunteers. <laughs> um, and so that's all students. Um, there's five on that because five is our, our sweet spot for that. There were way too many when I got here, everybody was on the leadership team, um, which, so we have five intentionally and things at the beginning, they're on every email about agendas and that kind of stuff. And they come to the board meeting for the first 15 minutes or so, and they give a student report because I think it's really important that the board hears the recap from a student, not from me. And of course, I'll add my two cents about stuff, but I think it's important it comes from them. And it's also, to me, this is a great life skill thing because we want these young people to be on boards and be members of their community after college. And so it's a great result. You know, it's a skill set that's unique and, and they have to interview to be on our leadership team also because it's a skill set 
more than it is betting. I can have a sense, you know, and be good. That's not the point. The point is, um, you, because it's also a life skill and an art. So and it's a great way for them to get to know each other. They also, the student president and then to the entire student leadership team gives feedback to the board about me twice a year. Um, sometimes that's super helpful. Sometimes it's, she did not buy us our favorite cereal on the retreat. That literally was a comment one time. Um, I'll take that over. She didn't show up to the ER, right? So it's one of those, like, we all, you know, we've all got hills we'll die on. But yeah, so so sometimes it's super intuitive and super helpful. We all learn a lot. Sometimes I bought the wrong cereal. Um, but it's, it's important to me that their voices are heard and not filtered through me ever. Um, and so then I give a report while the student is still on, because I want them to hear my perspective of the same events in the last month that they just talked about. And then the student leaves again because they've got homework and stuff and because the rest of it is confidential. So the students don't see the budget. They see like our student group budget line item, like they're privy to that. They're not privy to like the whole thing. Um, and they don't stay on because then I give the pastoral care report after the student has left, um, either the Zoom or in person because again, confidentiality. So that, that works really well for us. And that has been a huge piece of connection and that everybody really appreciates um and you know and it's so for this year it's been easy if the student couldn't come she sent it directly to the board member who does the agenda she didn't send it to me because it's you know i don't want it to ever you know because with them that, that and now it's also a different additional adults to have as a reference for a form one day because you know that kind of stuff and um and my board is super interested in what they think, what the you know leadership team thinks. And and it is those five are a good representation of the whole group. So it also gives a good pulse on where we're really at and what really matters and what doesn't and that kind of stuff. We have four minutes. Um... And so another question, uh, what do you include in the pastoral care report to your board? And how Ooh, did you decide to make that a part of your meetings with them? Okay, I decided to make that a part of my meetings, uh, partly, I, mean, I don't know how to say this, to emphasize what the heck we do and to reiterate just how much of my time that is, um, partly because it's a ton of time and they just didn't have a sense of it because they'd never they you know it's like anybody else's job i have no idea what anybody does their job any given day right like why would i i assume things that are probably really inaccurate and so some of it was just that it's sort of that mentality of you know pastors only work on sundays so sort of um to give them to the, have a better sense of like what my daily rhythms look like and because we have had an incredible amount so I don't give names unless, you know, if they're hospitalized and I have the student's permission, students know that I give a pastoral care report to the board and I leave gender and names out unless, you know, we've had some who are hospitalized for months and with their permission, I would say, you know, may I give your hospital address to the board if they want to send you cards and they would say yes or no. And so all the autonomy is on the student for that. Um, and they know that they know that I will not tell the board anything I don't have permission to. So typically in my report, it would be stuff like, like, like I mean, we had an example two weeks ago of a Sunday morning, a friend of a student found her number in my phone and said, you know, I'm really worried about so, so she accidentally overdosed. Here's the symptoms. I wanted to do you think we should go to the hospital and i said absolutely and i'll meet you there um i texted the two who are my hr committee and just said here's this thing going on i don't know what i'm walking into i don't know how this is going to end this might be a long day this might be a long-term day this might be a catastrophic day i just need y'all to know that we might have a thing um and they're like great let us know if you need support thanks for going you know that kind of stuff and so in that case like those two that I texted throughout the day, no more details that the rest of the board will not. But at the report that I give this coming Monday about that, it'll be like, you know, 
a couple weeks ago, we had a student accidentally overdose. Fortunately, they're fine. These two board members were really helpful in supporting me throughout the day. That's how I will publicly tell that story to the board. Um, and the board also know everything, you know, is all confidential there too, but it's the reason the student isn't there for that report is for a million reasons that they can figure out who each other are and that kind of stuff. And I also tell them about breakups within the group when we've had those. We had two leadership team members members break up the week before fall retreat, my first month here, and that was a train wreck. So something like that of these dynamics are really helpful for them to get a sense of like the interpersonal stuff. Um, and just to better understand that this role as campus ministers really is more and more private practice counseling with, you know, hopefully good theology and then sort of like running a summer camp because then you've got to go to Costco after you leave the hospital. And so part of it is just to really help people understand what the heck we do in this role. Was that answer your question, Elizabeth? Or is that just yes. more? It does, thank you. Okay, it's 2.29. Last question, Maggie, from Neil. Uh, is there a marketing thing you have done um, that you think would work well for campus ministry? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I have no background in marketing. All I know is social media is the reason this place exists. It, yes, it was people, of course, people, volunteers, but. Um, social media was free marketing that we did and intentionally did daily. Um, I, I don't, I don't even remember what I posted. It was maybe, you know, I posted, what am I eating today? What am I doing today? What kind of outreach are we doing? What's this fun thing coming up? Um, but we posted daily and people were able to, to get involved and feel a part of the story. Um, and that's why I think social media is so great because people, that's how people connect. And I think that is how college students connect. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, so many college students, they are on social. And so to engage them in social media, I think is just an easy answer um, and to make them feel a part of it. We also ask people to post. So asking those college students, can you post this event? And maybe we'll get one or two friends from you, from your, from your network to come to the event. Um, and so asking your college students to take a part in the social media as well by sharing by reposting but i think the answer is social media hands down and if you need yep. if you want to talk more about that feel free to email or call me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh we're going to end um right now and then if you all want to stay on after the recording ends um but i think this is a great place to end because this seems like the number one thing is about helping people feel a part of the story, whether it is um, through social media and making them feel like they're there, or it's by the students telling their stories or by you sharing the real stories about what's going on in a way that's mm -hmm. safe. Um, Ashley Ann, I think maybe others will want to find out about um, uh, how your HR committee kind of cares for you because it sounds like sure. that they um, that re they really did that. Um, and but but the number one key takeaway to today is really to um, invite people to be a part of the story and then invite people to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, and the people you need to invite to be a part are the ones who who really are passionate about what you do. Um, and we are all passionate about what you all do. And so thank you so much um, for being here. We really appreciate it.